Sunday morning service. Let's start with singing number 658. Number 658, Bring Them In. And we'll sing it and bring some more in while we're singing.
how it can be, but I know it's true. Jesus loves me, this I know. Number 708. 708, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. And that's sing the four verses, and then it'll be children's time.
let's take our Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And when you find your spot in the Word, let's stand again or remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 3. And we looked at the beginning of this chapter last week and we'll conclude it this morning. And let's read the whole chapter just to remind ourselves of the context. And um, our text this morning starts at verse number 12. Acts chapter 3, starting at verse number 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked, asked an, an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat, at, sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance he did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye Hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning, every, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the text that's before us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the disciples and their stand for the Lord. And Peter, in this passage, how he wasn't shy to preach the Lord Jesus Christ to those who had just rejected him just a few days before. I pray, Lord, that we'll have the same, the same courage, Lord, the same zeal to, to tell others about our Savior, even the ones who have already heard and already rejected it. 
I pray, Lord, that we'll have the courage to tell them again about our wonderful Savior. And I pray, Lord, that we'll learn from Peter in this passage of Scripture and learn from the example that you've given us in the Word of God. I pray that you'll fill me with your Spirit, Lord, to preach your Word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Probably one of the hardest things in the world is telling the same people the same story over and over again, praying and praying for them to believe. You know, we, we love our loved ones. We look around in our city and see the ones that we see every day and the ones that we have already, already know where we stand, already know that we're Christians. And the hardest thing in the world is to just, you know, get the courage up to tell them one more time, you know. I mean, we've already been there. We've already had that conversation. Hopefully, we've already told them about our Lord and but what are we to do? You just got to tell them again. You know, I look at the Bible and I see over and over and over again, the Lord just keeps going back and telling them again. You go through the book of Acts and who are they talking to for the majority of the book of Acts? Who are they dealing with? Who are they preaching the gospel to first as they go into all the world? It's the nation of Israel. It's the same nation, the same people that had said, we will not have this man reign over us. It's the same people who just days before had rejected the Savior and had nailed him to a cross. It's the same ones who said, no, we will not have this man, and they turned from the Lord. But what do the disciples do? What would the Lord have us do with those in our lives who we've told the gospel to? They just keep telling them again. Tell them again. Keep telling them the wonderful story of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, today, as we look at this passage in the book of Acts, I, I want to stress this, this, this point that they were telling them again and that we need to go to those that we love and those that we've told the gospel to and we need to tell them again. Tell them the wonderful story of Jesus again. Number one this morning, as you look at this text, what are we telling them? Telling them, number one, about the one they have rejected the one they have rejected. In the opening verses of our text, Peter is standing there before this multitude and he's explaining to them the miracle of the healing of this blind man. Uh, not, not this blind man, this lame man. This man that couldn't walk who now is leaping as the heart. And everyone's looking at Peter and John as if they had done some great miracle. And Peter's like, don't, don't look at us. This wasn't our work. This wasn't our doing. It wasn't by our own power or our holiness that this man is walking. This was done through the power of God. This was done through the name of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at what he says in verse 13. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murder to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And what is he telling them about? He's telling them about the Savior. He's telling them about the one they've already rejected. And we need to turn to a world that's lost, turn to the ones that already maybe have heard the story, and those that haven't, and tell them about the one they have rejected, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see three things for us to tell them about our Savior. Number one, they told them about his glory. This is a wonderful Savior. In this message that Peter preaches, he actually gives six titles for our Savior. We're looking at a title of our Savior tonight. I hope that you come back tonight for one of our favorite titles. He says in Song of Solomon 2 verse 1, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. And we're looking at that this evening. And the titles of our Savior, they, they all tell us something wonderful about him. Always tell us something that describes for him who he is and what he does. And you go through this sermon by Peter in Acts chapter 3 and you say, Pastor, this sermon, you just read it, it only took like five seconds. Why can't you preach as short as Peter did here in Acts chapter 3? 
I said, I'm sorry. I, I think it was probably longer. They just didn't write every word for us here in the Bible. Okay, but anyways. <laughs> but uh, these six titles that are given here, they all describe the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Holy One and the Just in verse number 14. He, he is the Prince of Life in verse number 15. He is the Christ in verse number 18. He is the prophet in verse number 22. He is the seed of Abraham in verse number 25. And at the very beginning, he is God's son, the son of God. God, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son, Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. Tell them who Jesus is. Tell them how God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Tell how he loved men. Tell the life of Jesus. Tell, tell how he went about doing good. Tell how he died on Calvary's tree. Tell how he rose from the dead. Tell them the stories of Jesus. When you talk to others, do you lift up the Savior? Can they tell from talking to you that Jesus is your Lord, that Jesus is your King, that He's the one you're living for? Tell them about His glory. But also tell them about their guilt. You look at this message that Peter preached, and it was a very pointed message. And while you realize the gospel is good news, literally, that's what gospel means. Gospel means good news. But the good news still comes with a, with a point as it reminds people of their sin. You know, nobody wants to hear about their sin, do they? Nobody wants to admit that they're a sinner. Don't tell me that I'm a sinner. Except the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, we live in Canada, and I'm going to say we are surrounded by moral people. Uh, there are lots of good people in Canada. Of course, Canada has people that are criminals and but there's good people in Canada. I remember one day I was in Toronto, which if anything's going to go wrong, that's where it's going to be. I went to the bank. I took out $20 from the ATM. I walked away without it. And then I remembered like 20 minutes later, I didn't actually put the money in my wallet. And I was like, that money is gone. It's going to disappear. And my friends were like, yeah, you're in Toronto. This is just, it's gone. It's, it's not coming back. You're not seeing that again. I went back to the bank. And some good Samaritan had turned the $20 in, and there it was waiting for me. It's like, there's good people in this country. There's people that are decent, people with morals. But even moral people are sinners. Even moral people have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The fact remains, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, no matter how good you are, no matter how high your morals might be, you're guilty of the worst sin that anybody could ever commit. It's the sin of rejecting God's own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't forget that the people in Peter's sermon that he's talking to, these were moral people. These were the people at the temple. These were the people who came to bring to, to worship the Lord. These were people that knew the Old Testament. These were people that, that did their best and were zealous of good works. Why was that lame man sitting where he was? It was because these people that kept walking by, they were the ones that would take their alms and give it to him and meet his needs. They were good people. But they had committed the greatest crime in human history, the crime of rejecting God's own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. They were the greatest sinners, not because of their lack of morals, but because of their lack of the Savior. They had turned from the Savior. Verse 6, verse 13, God had glorified His Son, Jesus, verse 13, whom ye delivered up and denied Him in the presence of Pilate when He was determined to let Him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof ye are, we are witnesses. He tells them about their guilt. He tells them how they had chosen Satan's substitute instead of God's own son. Remember, Jesus is the son of God, but they 
delivered him up. They denied him in the presence of Pilate, who was ready to let him go. This was their crime, you realize. They couldn't pass it off on the Romans. They couldn't pass it off on Pilate. They couldn't look at someone else and say, he did it. No, this was their crime. They had rejected the Son of God. And the fact is, all of us are responsible for what we do with the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Individually, we are all responsible. You can't point to someone else. You can't say, that person, they they never told me. You can't say, well, I I, I think Christians just should live up to their obligations. If they lived up to their obligations, then I would have believed. No, you can't blame somebody else. It's you and the Lord. Have you accepted him or rejected him? Dr. Harry Ironside would tell the story of how he was a little boy and his mother would over and over and over again plead with him that he trust the Lord as a Savior. And Harry Ironside told his mother, listen, Mom, if, if I become a Christian, all my friends are going to laugh at me. And his mother said, Harry, they can laugh you out of heaven. They can laugh you, they can, they can laugh you into hell, she said, but they can never laugh you out of it. Now that's the truth. What you do with Jesus, that's up to you. And Peter's preaching to these ones that had denied God's own son. And you remember when Jesus was, was delivered up, how Pilate actually offered to let him go. Do you remember that? Pilate actually said, well, can, who, can, will I release this Jesus onto you? But instead, they said, not this man, but Barabbas. Not this man, but Barabbas. Interestingly enough, you know that Barabbas' name, Barabbas, Bar means son, Abba means father. Literally, his name means son of the father. It reminds us of Satan's substitute, doesn't it? Satan always has a substitute. Satan always has something else for you to choose. What have you chosen, Satan's substitute or God's own son, the Lord Jesus Christ? They had chosen Satan's substitute instead of God's Son. They had chosen sin instead of the Savior. Sin instead of the Savior. Verse 14, Ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. That's Barabbas. He's the murderer. You see the contrast here. How they chose a murderer, a thief, a man that was a great sinner instead of God's own holy and just Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were guilty. And it's a reminder that if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, you're making the same decision today. You're you're rejecting God's righteousness. The fact is, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. We are all as an unclean thing. We are all sinners. But God has offered us salvation through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's offered us forgiveness. He's offered us righteousness. But to reject Him is to choose sin instead of salvation. It's to choose our sin over God's remedy, the Lord Jesus Christ. And a person is guilty. They had chosen Satan's substitute instead of the Son of God, sin instead of the Savior. And verse 15 reminds us, they had chosen death instead of life. It says, and killed the Prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Prince of life, literally, the ruler of life, the author of life, the one in charge of life, the one who can give you life. They had life before them. But instead of life, they chose death and rejected the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And although these people were moral people, although they were zealous of good works, although they were what we would call good people, they were great sinners because they rejected God's own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's something, as Christians, we need to remember that people need the Savior. Yes, they're good people. Yes, they're moral people. But they're lost without Jesus Christ. And we need to tell them about the Savior, the Son of God, who died on the cross for their sins. Tell them about His glory. Tell them about, his, about their guilt. But tell them one more thing. Tell them about His grace here. In verse number 16, And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. One more thing for this first point here. But uh, 
You know, tell them what they're missing out on. We should tell people about how wonderful Jesus is. We should be telling people about his wonderful works. We should tell them about the difference that he makes in a heart and a life. Tell them what the difference that he's made in your life. Tell them of the difference he's made in the life of somebody else. Here are the disciples, they're preaching, and they have, a, they have example 101 right beside them. Here's a man that was lame. Here's a man that couldn't get up and walk. He was lame from his mother's room. He's now over 40 years old. Here's a man that was living his whole life in this condition. But the name of Jesus... The name of Jesus has made all the difference in the world. The name of Jesus has made him strong. Through faith in his name, he has been made whole. The name of Jesus. Tell them about that wonderful name. And tell the world that's lost in sin, who has been bound by sin their whole lives, not able to get out, not able to find the solution, not able to find the remedy. Tell them about the one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is able to save a lost sinner. He's still able to change the heart. He's still able to make new creatures in Christ Jesus. He's still able to turn them from darkness to light and to the power, from the power of Satan unto God. Tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell them again about the one they have rejected. Tell them again, number two, about the one who is ready to forgive. The one who is ready to forgive. You know, you read the Gospels and you, you remember them standing before, the, before Pilate and Pilate was determined to let him go and they said, not this man but Barabbas. You remember how Pilate said, washed his hands and he said, I am innocent of the blood of this man. And you remember how the nation of Israel stood there and said, his blood be on us and on our children. And you read that and you think, there's no chance. There's no hope now that that, that the whole nation, all of them, they're, they're lost. There's no way that God's going to forgive that great sin. Except you just read the next page and Jesus is on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And you see in this passage of Scripture, Peter goes from being the prosecuting attorney to being the defense attorney. He goes from being the one pointing to their guilt, reminding them of their sin, to saying, but guess what? I have good news for you. The Lord is ready to forgive. Look at verse number 17. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he had so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. You know, we should be an understanding witness, you know. Don't forget that the lost are, are dead, dead in trespasses and sins. Sometimes, well, I just mentioned that Many people are moral. At the same time, we as Christians see great sins in this world, don't we? And sometimes as Christians, we can, we, we can be so attack the sin, attack the sin, attack the sin over and over and over again, forgetting that they're dead in sin. They're forgetting that they're lost in sin. And what they need is to be told of the wonderful grace of God that can save them from sin. There was a, it was in 1992 that a Los Angeles County parking control officer saw a Cadillac that was illegally parked. And the officer went over and wrote a ticket for the man and just handed it through the window and drove away. And uh, never realized that uh, the man that was in the driver's seat was dead and had been shot in the head hours before and his head was slumped down with blood on his face. Uh, he was so quick to to write the ticket, and didn't even realize he was dead. You know, all around us are people who are dead in trespasses and sins. And we focus on the offenses, and we need to spend time to tell people that they're sinners. But don't just tell them of their sin. Point them to the Savior. Speak the truth in love, pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Peter speaks of their ignorance, he just understands that they just didn't know. 
They were blinded from the truth they didn't know. And tell them, tell them how Jesus died just for them. Verse 18 speaks of how Jesus died according to the scriptures. While they delivered him up, Peter reminds them this was God's plan for the forgiveness of sins. Man is guilty, but still Jesus was delivered by the determinate counsel of God. This was his will. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the fact is, we think of the death of Christ, and we see the men marching to arrest him. We see Judas betraying him. We see them leading him away. We see him standing before Pilate. We see the soldiers leading him up Calvary's mountain. We see them nailing him to the tree. And And we think that they're in control. Those men are in control. But they weren't in control. They were powerless against our Savior. He willingly gave himself. He gave himself for our sins. And while it was no mistake that the nation of Israel was guilty for what they had done, the fact is, Jesus was was so ready to forgive, so ready to restore them. One thing we need to remember when we we go through the book of Acts is that uh, many of the things that we know and believe to be true were mysteries to them. The church age was a mystery. Do you know that the rapture was a mystery? We're looking for what's the next great event that we're looking for. We're looking for the rapture when the Lord comes for his church and we meet him up in the air. And that's what we're looking forward to. But uh, when when Paul describes the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15, he tells them, behold, I show you a mystery. That was something that had not been revealed before time, that God had made known to Paul that is written in the Bible for us today. But you read this passage right here, and you realize that the rapture was still a mystery to them. As Peter is preaching this passage of Scripture, as he's preaching to these people, he's telling them, if you believe on the Lord, if you as a nation receive him, Jesus will come back today. (laughs) He'll come back right now. The theme of the book of Acts, or one of the themes, is the presentation of the king. Once again, the the Lord presented himself as king for his ministry for three and a half years. John the Baptist introduced the king, and all throughout it, it was the gospel of the kingdom. And in the book of Acts, it's still the gospel of the kingdom. The apostles are going and telling the nation of Israel, here is your king. Will you accept your king? But as we see over and over and over again, the nation of Israel rejects the Savior, and he's taken to the Gentiles and to the uttermost parts of the earth, something that God foreknew, something that God knew was going to happen. But he was long-suffering to them and offered them a chance over and over and over again, just the same. And Peter's standing here talking to the same people that had rejected the Savior. And he said, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, erased, cleared, your name name cleared of this sin. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his prophets since the world began. You believe. He'll send his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we're not waiting for Israel. We're waiting to repent. And today we're waiting for the rapture of the church. But the fact remains, when Jesus does return At the end of the tribulation period, it will be when Israel as a nation is ready to receive him. The rapture, of course, is in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye. And uh, tell them about the one who is ready to forgive. Tell them, number three, one more thing this morning. Tell them about his held out hand. Verses 22 to 26 Peter reminds them of prophecies, promises that God's given concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. For Moses truly said unto the fathers in verse 22, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul that will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after As many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying unto Abraham 
And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. This was all in fulfillment of God's promises. Jesus is the prophet like unto Moses. He's come to speak the words of God. We hear him to be saved. We reject him to the peril of our souls. The prophets Samuel and all after have spoken of these days. And in those last verses, Peter gives a a personal invitation to the nation of Israel. He reminds them of the promise of God, of the seed of Abraham, how Jesus Christ would be the seed of Abraham in whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And verse 26, he says, Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. He's offering salvation to you today. He's offering a blessing to you today. He's offering you forgiveness of sins today. The question is, will you take it? Will you take the offer that God is extending to you today? You talk about the best gifts you can give or receive. This is the best one. God is offering us salvation. He's offering it through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you received that gift today? You know, the offer still stands. We're talking about when Jesus comes back and when he returns. And often people will say, well, is he ever going to come back? Why hasn't he come back yet? Well, the answer is because he wants to hold out the offer a little longer. God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's holding out the offer a little longer, waiting for them to believe on him, waiting for them to be saved. Though they have slighted him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Back to the narrow way, patiently lead them. He will forgive if they only believe. And the nation of Israel, ultimately as a nation, they rejected the Savior. As we go through the book of Acts, we'll see their ultimate rejection at the stoning of Stephen. We'll see them rejecting still at the end, and the, Christ, the Jews abroad reject him uh, in Acts 28 when Paul speaks to them the gospel in Rome. But throughout it, you still see lots of individuals getting saved, don't you? In fact, after this message, we said last week in Acts chapter 4, verse number 4, it says, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. 5,000 got saved that day. 5,000 accepted the Lord that day as a result of this message because Peter turned around and he told them again. You know, we need to tell them again. Peter was telling the same ones who had rejected him and nailed him to the tree one more time about the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is he telling them again and again and again and again? Because God is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Even the ones that have already rejected, his hand is still stretched out, offering them salvation if they'll only believe. Will you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? Maybe there's someone today that's been putting off the offer. Listen, today the offer stands. Tomorrow it might be too late. We don't know. Today is the day of salvation. Now, if you will hear his voice, nobody is guaranteed tomorrow. But today you can be saved. Right now the opportunity still is open for you to turn from sin and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And then Christian, will you tell them again? Will you tell them again about the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, with What's been going on this past year, we haven't had our annual visit from our brother Abe Lehman. And Abe Lehman's a wonderful Christian and look forward to, Lord willing, seeing him again uh, within the next year, within this year or so. But uh, you remember the story, his story, don't you? Abe Lehman got saved here in our church. Um, I think it was back in 2007 or 2008, or something like that way back then. And he's been on fire for the Lord ever since. And when he comes to Halifax, he'll go to Eastern Passage and stand on the boardwalk there, and he'll 
continually pass out tracts to anyone that he meets and try to witness to people and tell them about the wonderful Savior. You will remember that when he got saved, his wife didn't get saved. His wife was lost, and he witnessed to her over and over and over again, continually kept taking the gospel to her, trying to win her to the Savior, and she was hardened against it. She was strong-willed against it. She wouldn't receive Jesus as her Savior. But he just kept telling her again, telling her again, telling her again. The time came when she was in the hospital, and she wasn't really able to, to talk back, but she could still hear everything. She could still understand everything. She just couldn't talk anymore. And he was there with her. She was on her deathbed and trying to witness to her and telling her the gospel one more time. And the nurse, his wife wasn't too responsive. Well, she was, she was understanding it all, but she couldn't say anything. But the nurse said, why don't you ask her to, to squeeze your hand if she's understanding? Squeeze your hand if, if she knows what you're saying and to do something. And so she, he told her the gospel again. He asked her if she understands it. If you do, will you squeeze my hand? She squeezed his hand. And she, he said one more time, Will you accept Jesus to be your Savior? Will you put your trust in him? And one more time, she squeezed his hand. And she accepted the Lord as her Savior right there on her deathbed because her husband just told her again and again and again. And so it is for us today. We have loved ones. We have those around us that are lost. Just tell them again. Noah preached for 120 years. He's a bad example because he didn't have any converts, okay? But tell them again, <laughs> tell them again, over and over and over again, the wonderful story of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for the text that's before us. Thank you that you took the gospel to the Jew first, even though they were the ones that rejected it, even though they were the ones that turned their back on the Savior and nailed, had him nailed to the tree. But you showed all long suffering to them, Lord, and telling them again. And Lord, it's a reminder to us that we need to have that same long suffering to the people in our, in our homes, the people in our families, the people that we work with, the people that we see every day. And I pray, Lord, that we'll be like you and that we'll tell them again about our wonderful Savior. And I pray, Lord, that we'll see souls come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior today, Lord, before it's too late. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I wondered this morning, is there someone who has been putting it off? Somebody that hasn't received God's offer yet of salvation? If that's you this morning, just raise your hand, and we'd love to take a Bible and show you how you can be saved. Anyone at all. Our Father, thank you for the time we've had in your word. Pray that you help us, Lord, to tell others about the Savior again. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's take our songbooks this morning and go to number 668, A Passion for Souls. Number 668, and we'll stand together and sing all the verses.
Rose of Sharon and the Lily of the Valley. Best to see you there.